out there, rock and rollers. Welcome to the 88th edition of the Ugly American Werewolf in London Rock Podcast. Hosted by me, the Wolf, Mag B, uh, and my co-host, Action Jackson, who's on the East Coast of America. And we hope you're all doing well. We can't thank you enough for all the support and all the listens we had on last week's episode, our interview with Steve Hackett, the legendary guitar player, ex-Genesis member, who is a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, who's just on a whirlwind tour right now, and he just does not stop. He's been doing his Seconds Out tour for about a year here, maybe a little bit more, uh, and that kind of continues. He's going to be doing some stuff with Jave in Europe here in August, and then in September, his Foxtrot of 50s tour starts in the UK. Of course, he'll be coming to North America to finish up some Seconds Out stuff, but uh, I'm hopeful, and a lot of North American fans are hopeful that he'll be continuing Foxtrot at 50 in 2023 in North America. We got a lot of great feedback, and we really appreciate it. We really thank Steve Hackett, of course, for coming on, someone who we wanted to have on for a long time, and uh, and finally got him on. Hopefully we can have him again, because it's not like he's not going to have anything to promote, because all he does is tour and make records, put out live albums, he wrote a book, he's the man, and we appreciate ha- him coming on, and we appreciate you listening. But this week, we're going to go back to our hard rock roots kind of move off the prog scale for just a minute we're going back to our hard rock roots and we're going to tackle an album that was just ginormous in america really in north america in 1987 and 1988 and that's white snake the 1987 self-titled classic that had huge huge hits like here i go again still of the night deeper the love just a juggernaut that sold over eight million copies in America. I think it went five times platinum in Canada. Wasn't quite as big here in the UK. And of course, that's something we talk about a lot on this show, how some bands or some records make it big on one coast, but for whatever reason, they're not nearly as big on the other. I do think MTV had a lot to do with that. And I just think American tastes and sensibilities at that time in 87 were just, it all aligned great for Whitesnake. Of course, they had some videos with a certain video vixen, Tawny Katane, which really helped propel their popularity as well, which maybe didn't hit as hard over here in the UK. But it's not just me and Jackson this week talking about this classic. We've got a special guest in, and those who know us know that we love Shout It Out Loudcast, the greatest KISS podcast in the world, and they do have... Uh, I guess you would call a bit of a side project they do about once a month called the Album Review Crew, where they get together and review a classic non-Kiss related album with their friend Sonny Pooney of Growing Up Rock. And Sonny was generous enough to come on to our show this week because this is his bang zone, if you will. This kind of mid to late 80s hard rock that was all over MTV and all over classic rock and popular radio at the time. Uh, and Sonny, he's a little bit older than us. He's got a lot of experience, been to a lot of shows. Uh, and so we get to know him a little bit on this show, hear how this album came into his life, how it affected him, uh, how he saw them on the tour, and, and what he's uh, and how he's experienced White Snake since. So Sonny, great guy, great radio voice. Uh, he tells some great stories on here, and we can't wait to get to that here really shortly. Now, a little bit of business. Of course, we are part of the Pantheon Podcast Network, a network of over 100, or almost 100, uh, music podcasts, music-related podcasts of all genres. There's definitely something in there for you. And we do like to give shout-outs to the folks we've worked with, either been on their show or had on ours, like Jay Scott from The Hook Rocks, like Paul Richardson from This Day Rocks and Vintage Rock Pod, another guy with a great radio voice. And, of course, the Kiss Kings, Tom and Zeus, and the Shout It Out Loud cast. And Christy Alexander Hallberg of Rock Is Lit, that's one you're going to hear about here real soon. Uh, and we can't wait for you to start to, to, to get to know Christy and her cool podcast, which is uh, going to be part of the Pantheon Podcast family. Also, we need to take time out to say thank you to our sponsors, rarevinyl.com, eil.com. Been in business for more than three decades with over 250,000 items in stock of rare and great quality shipping all over the world. So no matter what your genre or what you might be looking for, whether it's a rare Kiss picture disc for the Shout It Out Loudcast fans, or it's a 
First edition, Foxtrot, for you Steve Hackett fans who want to be nostalgic and get a nice collectible before he starts his mega tour this fall, go to rarevinyl.com or eil.com and use code PODCAST, P-O-D-C-A-S-T, and you'll get 10% off your order, which always helps with things like shipping costs, and they ship all over the world. So if you're in one of the 100 plus countries that have heard our podcast, You can get rarevinyl.com to ship you the music that you want. All right, well, back to Sonny and Whitesnake. David Coverdale is obviously the star of Whitesnake, founded the band, always been in it. The only member that's never not been in Whitesnake came out of the ashes of Deep Purple. Uh, And this is a weird time for them. I mean, he was writing songs with John Sykes, who'd been in Thin Lizzy and Tigers of Pantang, and he had some great musicians like Don Airy, like Ansley Dunbar, like Neil Murray, to help him make the record. But then there was a bit of a mutiny, or David had to go under some surgery, and they maybe thought about going on without him. So after they made the record, he then put together an all-star group without them, you know, namely Rudy Sarzo you know, on bass, namely Vivian Campbell and Adrian Vandenberg on guitar, you know. They made a lot of great videos and had huge success on this millions and millions sold around the world but the ones you saw in the videos and on tour that year were not the ones who made the music except for David Coverdale so we're going to get into all that me Action Jackson and Sonny Pooney we're reviewing White Snake's 1987 self-titled classic right here on The Wolf Uh, so to give our our folks a little bit of background I mean you know I, I love Listen to you with ARC, you know, I love you and Stephen Michael kind of giving your two different opinions on the stuff that you love. You love a lot of the stuff we do, right? I mean, Jackson, you're a little bit older than we are, right? We, we, Jackson and I are the exact same age as Tom and Zeus, right? So, like, you would have been a senior when we were, like, in the eighth grade or ninth grade or something like that. Like, you're, you're like an older brother. So, like, when, when 1984 Van Halen's hitting and we're 11 and we love hearing Panama coming out of the speakers, you're in high school at that point, right? So it's, it's a little different from you the way some of this stuff hits you. And what we're talking about today with Whitesnake – that's probably like your senior year of high school, yeah? I uh, came out, I'm a year out of high school, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm starting to make my own money. So at this point, I don't have to count on Christmas money and birthday money to go buy albums. I got a mm. job and uh, <laughs> I'm buying the albums I want to buy. Yeah. So did you buy this one when it came out originally? Yeah, so I worked for uh, Target for 14 years. Sweet. And okay. most of that time was in the music and movies area. So I knew every album that was coming out, every you know, Friday or Tuesday, whenever it would come out Mm -hmm. and we would have it, I don't know, a week before it distributed. And then a lot of the times we would play it on the TVs, but it would be part of the promotion that the record company paid. Now, see, that's awesome to me. You know, I mean, getting music before it comes out, because I remember when they would come out on Tuesdays, for whatever reason, they put records out on Tuesdays and Jackson and I on Monday be like, okay, you know, we've got class at one o'clock, you've got class at two o'clock, but then at three, we get in the car, we're going to go to Peaches, we're going to get the brand new whatever album, you know, kind of thing. But if you got it ahead of time, you know, it's, it's kind of like a couple of times we've gotten, because we're interviewing people on their new upcoming album, maybe their PR manager sends us an advanced copy of it. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. We get it before everybody else does. So as a teenager in your 20s, that must have just been the bomb. Yeah, it didn't happen all the time and you would get a song or two. And then, you know, you get fired if you buy it before the day. But of course. if we opened at 9 o'clock, I buy it at 9.01. So I'm the first guy <laughs> that's got it. And we got CD players connected to all of the TV. So I'm popping in the CD player. And I made some mistakes. You know, the Bullet Boys 1-2 FU. Like, I didn't oh, know man. it was going to start that way. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I made some mistakes. But uh, for the most part, it was okay. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, because when they started doing the uh, advisory sticker on on the albums you didn't know i mean you knew it was on there but you didn't know where it was and you didn't know was it like just one word or yeah was it prominently in the song so yeah that was kind of a crapshoot yeah and i stayed away from you know if anybody looked like wasp i'm like all right i probably can't play that at work <laughs> right but white snake looked like you know clean cut leather pretty boys you know so yeah it's okay exactly yeah all right so how much was mtv an influence on you i mean like from 1981 on when you were in high school is that where you're getting all your new music from besides, you know, rock radio? Yeah, I don't really get into music until 84, so I'm already uh, about to become a sophomore. 
and MTV is rocking and rolling by that point. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, that's why I'm into all the top 40 stuff. And I love the boy bands and I love Duran Duran and I love Prince and I haul of notes because mm-hmm. you're watching all these videos waiting for the next Ingve Momstein video, but they only played it once every, you know, two, two and a half days or whatever. Right. <laughs> three o'clock in the morning. So uh, MTV was huge for me. Huge. And it was huge for us too. I mean, I think it was huge for our whole generation. It's great to be in the car, you know, listen to the radio or something like that. But suddenly you've got this kind of national jukebox that also you can see. And like we said on our Duran Duran episode, I'm a skinny white kid. Well, these are skinny white guys, right? With cool haircuts and cool clothes. I'm like, someone take me shopping, get me a cool haircut. I could be in Duran Duran, right? You know, it's because I couldn't be Michael Jackson. I can't do the moonwalk. I'm never going to look like David Lee Roth. But I'm like, hey, look at Rick Ocasek. He's skinny. He's pale. He's got black hair. I could do that. You know, yeah, it's possible. Yeah, my uh, running joke is, you know, the best invention of my lifetime was the iPod. And if mm. that exists while I'm in high school, I don't graduate. Because I was already sneaking in auto reverse cassette dip decks with, you know, the skin tone color one piece earphone going through my shirt to my <laughs> ear as I'm leaning on my right ear. You know, I'm doing that in English class every day, listening right. to, you know, love it first thing or whatever. And yes. coughing when the auto reverse, co- you know, flips or whatever. Um, you would think that I had a cold my whole high school <laughs> career, you know, and then you went to carrying around CDs or carrying around tapes or whatever, but yeah. oh my God, if the iPod comes out in 84, I don't graduate. Like I'm a huge music nut at that point. Yeah, no, I, when Jackson, and I talk about all the time, you know, we, we didn't really have internet in college. But as soon as the internet was huge and all of a sudden Napster comes along in 2000, like I'm a professional, I already have my own home, but at night after work, that's all I'm doing is downloading stuff. And I'm like, if this had happened 10 years before Jackson, we never would have gone to class. We'd be sitting in the room, you know, thousands of songs all day. Mom, Dad, I need a new computer. We just bought you one last year. I know, but that had 300 gigs. I need like... Eight terabytes, you know, for all this information, because I'm trying to get every song ever made, you know, or if I heard it on the radio for 30 seconds in 1983. I got to have that album and I got to have every album they ever made, you know, to see if there are any more like that one song. Right. So, yeah, we're, we're kind of fortunate for the time we were born in, I think. Yeah. Napster, uh, you know, by the time Napster comes out, I'm almost in my 30s. I was using it as I use YouTube and Wiki today. Mm-hmm. As a black hole thing. So it's like, I got to go get everything white snake. I've right. never heard looking for love. Like, I don't remember. I didn't get the single. I bought the album. So why the hell would I go get the single? I already got the album. I didn't, exactly. I didn't think about CD singles all the time, you know? And uh, so when you were going to a black hole, yeah, I would say that I, uh, not that they can do anything to me now, but uh, yeah, I uh, partake. I partaked. Is that a word? In Napster, even Part-tuck. though it was illegal. Yeah, no, I mean, I, part I, I, yeah, yeah, part <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, we all did. I actually, and I got kicked off for a while because I had the nerve to download a Metallica song that was on a soundtrack that wasn't on all the Metallica records that I owned, right? So, I, you know, I got busted for that. But I, I, I did, here's the thing yes, you were downloading stuff, and some stuff you were never going to buy, but some stuff I downloaded it and I liked it so much that then when they made something new, I would buy their new record, you know, or I would go see them live because now I'm familiar with their stuff. So there are pluses and minuses to it. Um, Plus, uh, you know, eventually my computer just blew up because it was just old and I had a bunch of band-aids on it. I put too many songs on it. So I guess that was, uh, is that poetic justice? Probably so. Well, then too, the the whole Napster deal was kind of the the music industry's Dirty Little Secret. There were a lot of great songs buried on really crappy records. So yeah, I don't want to write, I don't want to buy the whole thing, but I will take that one or two songs that I really loved. Fair enough. Yeah. And you could say that Spotify is the Napster of today, right? I do the same thing with Spotify because guys with growing up rock, we get stuff ahead of time all the time. And you will not believe how many people tell me this sounds like Hailstorm. (laughs) <laughs> and I listen to it and I'm like, dude, just because it's got a female vocal, it doesn't right. sound like Hailstorm, right? But if I run into something that I like, then I'm like, okay, I want to go support the band, Yeah, right? I've got the disposable income to do so. I'm going to do it through their website, blah, blah, blah. But I got to hear two or three songs before I do that. I'm not just going to blind buy everything because it's just too much stuff. Right. 
Right. And the collection's already big enough. I mean, you know, I was I was bummed because we, we had to downsize in a big way. Leaving from the Midwest to go to central London, you can't bring all your stuff with you. And and it was determined, Mac, you can't bring your CD collection with you. That's just not coming, you know. Uh, so I'm like, all right, fine. Fair enough. We've got Alexa. You know, I, I'll pay the extra four bucks so I can get everything in there. But now we're moving again. And of course, I have hundreds of more CDs that I've collected over the last three years, you know. It's like it, it never ends, you know. And there's all these books I have, you know, most of which I haven't read all the way through yet because who has time for that? But yeah, I mean, I, I get it. You know, it, it used to be I hear one song on the radio. All right, let's go out and buy it. It, it all has to be pretty good, you know. But now it's like, no, you got to show me a little. I got to hear something before I make that commitment. And not even the, the money concerned so much as it is. If I'm going to add it, you know, it's going to stack up here. I got to know there's some value there, you know. I, I wouldn't have moved. I would say, take my CDs and leave me here <laughs> and I'll show up later. <laughs> right. Hi, guys. This is Chris Slade, drummer of ACDC and many others. And you're listening to the ugly, I mean, really ugly, werewolf in London. <laughs> Let's let's kind of get into uh, to White Snake, the 1987 self-titled White Snake album on Geffen Records, which was huge in the United States. I'd say big all over the world, but I mean, looking at the sales figures, like it it maybe went gold in the UK, whereas it went like eight times platinum or something like that in America. It's much more successful in our home country, and I think MTV has a hell of a lot to do with that. But you know, why don't we start with We'll let Jackson start this, Sonny, and we'll let you go afterwards. Like, how did you originally remember hearing the songs or, or getting, you know, getting to know this record back in 87, 88 when it was big? It was MTV, all MTV all the time. Like, it was on rock radio, but the videos were on every third play, I think. Mm -hmm. And for a while, they had, like, three going at the same time when you right. kind of got that sweet spot. So, yeah, it was on all the time. And, I mean, not to beat around the... Uh, you have to beat around the proverbial bush, but the star of the show was Miss Tawny Katane. And that's why everybody wanted to watch the video. And I think that's that's what really kind of propelled it forward was the the the, the visual. You wanted the song was good, but you wanted to see the video again. You wanted to see what these guys look like. You wanted to see her. So yeah, for this one, MTV really pushed it over the edge. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it was it was so big on MTV. And it was just, it was in that sweet spot, that 87, 88, 89 sweet spot where you've got Def Leppard, Bon Jovi, Motley Crue, all making huge, huge records. Huge. And Cinderella was coming out right after that, right? I mean, it, it just, it, it fit. And you know how it is in the music industry. If it works, copy it and beat it to death until the people tell you, we need Nirvana to get rid of all those people, right? So that, that was in the heyday of what they call, it's kind of a pejorative term, hair metal, but it communicates and we all know what we're talking about there. How about for you, Sonny? Now you're, you're a working man, you're buying your own records, still watching MTV. How are you getting into Whitesnake? Yeah, I was already into Whitesnake because mm -hmm. my first album purchase ever with my own money included slide it in oh wow so i was already i was already a white snake fan and then you know the tawny katane thing for me it's a bonus because i think if you're watching those videos when you're 11 12 13 you're seeing her as somebody that you can't see in real life that you want to be with i'm at 18 now so mm -hmm. i've seen those type of women at clubs I right. still can't go up and talk to them or anything. And <laughs> right. you know they're still ungettable, but they seem more real. So that was more of a bonus. And Tawny Katane is interesting because, you know, you see her bachelor party. She's okay, but she's not smoking. Right. You, she gets to 87. All of a sudden she's smoking. By the time she's in the new WKRP, like in the, in the early nineties, mm -hmm. she's bona fide hot. Right. Right. So something happened. I don't know if it was a hairdo. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was the clothes she was wearing. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but yeah. So that was a bonus to me, but yeah, it was all MTV. The minute still the night hit, I'm like, Oh my God, what the hell is that? Yeah. And I had friends saying, well, that sounds like Zeppelin. I'm like, I don't even know who Zeppelin is. I don't listen to Zeppelin yet. Right. I oh, didn't get right? Zeppelin until afterwards. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is the kind of music that got me into Zeppelin because people would every once in a while say, that person sounds like Zeppelin. That person sounds I'm like, sooner or later, I'm probably going to have to listen to Zeppelin because <laughs> for some reason, all these people sound like Zeppelin all of a sudden. Yeah. yeah but back to what you were saying before, they kind of sold you the whole package. 
like it was the it was the sexy woman who like we said we were a little bit younger so yeah i mean that was that was something we've never seen before yeah. yeah yeah they had the you know they were they were fairly good looking guys they were selling you this this jet set lifestyle they had the the jaguars uh, in the Here I Go Again video, which still look cool today. If you see one of those, you know, 86, 87 Jags, that's a good looking car. So it was this whole thing with, yeah, I mean, could I be that person someday? That's so awesome. This lifestyle that was just almost on another world. Yeah, no, totally. You know, and and it was like that for me. Now, the, the problem was, I, you know, I kind of went to this, I kind of went to this posh, you know, private school where everybody dressed the same and everybody had the hair, same haircuts. Like it wasn't like a John Hughes film where it's like the rich kids are here and the stoners are over here and the goth kids are here and the jocks are here. It's more like Saved by the Bell where everybody did everything, you know, and they all looked the same and they all acted the same. So sometimes if you like what some people would call, well, that's kind of redneck music. You had to take some, to take some guff for it. I remember when I had a, uh, a slippery one wet cassette and some girls, you know, in my class were laughing at me for like, Oh, you like Bon Jovi? And I'm like, yeah, I like Bon Jovi. Who do you like? You know, Richard Marks, no offense, Sonny. Uh, but <laughs> I know you're a fan. Uh, no, but that's okay. Um, you know, so, uh, but then Whitesnake comes out and yeah, they got all that hair, but there's something a little, especially still the night, there's something kind of tough and cool about this song. You know, it, it's, it's not just like talking about, grabbing your girl and going down to the malt shop, you know, still in the night with this heavy riff. And then the, but we'll get into the songs here in a minute. And obviously I'd heard some of the older tunes that they did, you know, back in the, like the Mer Bernie Marsden days. Whitesnake's kind of an interesting story in that they, they came out of the remnants of Deep Purple. And then over the years, they kind of had a rotating cast of characters, but it's kind of an amazing cast when you think about people like, Ian Pace and John Lord of Deep Purple, Cozy Powell was in it for a while, Ansley Dunbar, who we'll talk about today, Bernie Marsden. I mean, a lot of different, Don Airy, you know, was in Deep Purple and Black Sabbath and Ozzy and so many people, John Sykes, Vivian Campbell. I mean, a, a rotating cast of characters always led by David Coverdale, but the talent level was pretty top notch. Yeah, he was always good at getting great musicians around him. Yeah, and they had Martin Birch and Roger Glover as producers right out of the gate, right? So they were going to have premium musicians. These guys aren't coming out of the clubs and nobody knows who the hell they are. Right. Coverdale's got a name. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, we'll go through a little bit, a little bit, but I think you got to give him a lot of credit for, I think he figured out that he was flatlining with the mm -hmm. sound that he had and that he was going to be X and never be bigger. And it happens to bands, right? Like you yeah. can only attain so much if you're going to stick with a certain sound, if you're not going to go for the mass appeal. And you could say sold out, blah, blah, whatever, dude. I love the Black Album. I don't care if Metallica sold out, right? Yeah. Metallica doesn't get me unless they release the Black Album. Now, that's not my favorite Metallica album. No. But they don't even get me unless they have that. Exactly. Right? So exactly. if you're going to sell 8 million copies, you're going to have to do the Bon Jovi thing. And yeah. they already knew what the Bon Jovi thing was. So it's like, you know what? Let's just go do that. And you can't sell 8 million copies in the U.S. with one song. Or really even two. Two big hits helps. Maybe you can get to three or four. But you can't sell 8, 10 million copies, you know, unless there's a bunch of songs on there. And it all kind of fits together and is of the era. So, yeah, say what you want. But, I mean, we got to give some credit to John Kalodner of Geffen here, the a and r maestro, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame member, who put John Sykes and David Coverdale together. Because I think Coverdale, after sliding in, he's like, okay, I'm going to take a break. But then after a couple of years, I think he was broke. It's like, it wasn't back then he had all these royalties. He didn't write Smoke on the Water or anything. He was in Latter-day Purple, right? So he, he kind of burned through all his earnings. Like, oh my God, I got to get back up on the horse again. So I think he was ready to try something. But it's Kalodner and Geffen and, and David Geffen's muscle that they kind of helped push this into the great success that it was. And I think there was a story too that this album kind of had a rocky beginning and Kalodner was told basically that his job was on the line with this thing. So I think it kind of really lit a fire under him. Like this has to be big. We have to do whatever we need to do to get this thing to blow up. And back to your point before Mac, having three or four hits at the same time or kind of in a row, it propels it because it's always there. It, it Once one kind of falls off, they have another one to replace it. And that's how you get your 8 million albums sold. Yeah. yeah there's, there's only two ways. It's either what you guys are talking about, where it's got to be, you've got a few songs that the record company is pushing. 
You add a vixen to it. You get some sexiness. You got the class of being an Englishman. You got all this stuff like working to kind of roll you down the hill. Or you got to be unbelievably lucky and there is nothing else out, aka metal health. There's right. nothing else on the charts and you can go number one and have a long lasting career. Now, Quiet Riot's not the Quiet Riot of old, but even if Dubro was around, I'm not sure they're selling, you know, theaters. They're still right. probably selling clubs, but you can have a number one album, but then you got to get lucky. That's right. No, no, you're right. And, and who kept them from being number one? It was like Whitney Houston or, or Michael Jackson's bat. Like they got to number two with this album. They never quite got to number one because some serious, serious artists were right ahead of them. You know, even their singles maybe lost out to something like Faith by George Michael, which may not be my favorite. But it's a huge song, right? It's, everybody lost out to that song that week. It's not your fault, you know, kind of thing. But I want to take it back to what you said, Jackson, because I didn't know that about Collagner, but it does not shock me. Because when, when I saw the documentary about David Geffen, he sold Arista, which had Beatles and Jackson Brown and all that in the 70s. Then he came back in the 80s and started Geffen over. But he kind of overpaid for artists that were past their prime, like John Lennon, like Elton John, like Donna Summer. And he, I can't, I can't. He convinced some enormous company to buy half of his of his company, and then from 1980 to 1985 or 86, it hemorrhaged money. It did not do very well at all. He basically then got the executive to say, "You don't have to. You don't have to keep it anymore. Like I'll just take it back from you, or I'll buy it back from you. You don't have to have it." And then from 86 to into the 90s, that's when it took off, when it exploded, because they had Aerosmith and White Snake and eventually Nirvana and all these people. But at that point, yeah, I believe that John Collodner's probably job was on the line because Aerosmith hadn't come back with Run DMC yet, and there was no White Snake, right? And there, you know, they they still had all these legacy bands that weren't really selling that well. So it's it's interesting that someone like David Geffen was kind of on the rocks when now he's one of the most powerful people in the history of Hollywood. Well, and I think too it was a deal where you pushed this deal, you pushed these guys, and you said this was going to be big. And I've got you know, like you said, I've got people barking at my door to get these things done, and it, it, you have to, you, this has to happen. And then it, there was something with with Coverdale where he had sinus surgery or he had this whole awful infection. And so they had done some work on the record, but then it kind of just dead stopped. And so the bills are piling up. Nothing's happening. Everybody's upset. He doesn't even know if he's going to sing again. So now what are we going to do? Do we scrap this whole thing? And I can imagine Kalodner just sitting at his desk or at his home just thinking, this could be it. I don't know what's going to happen now. That's why I believe the story is true. That Sykes went to Kalodner and said, hey, we could just get somebody else to sing it. Mm -hmm. Right? We could do that. There's plenty of great singers out there. It's right. the mid-80s. You could throw a rock and hit a great singer probably. Right? right. Or not, you know, maybe not Coverdale, but close enough kind of thing. So I don't doubt that that happened. And... I can't fault Coverdale for, you know what? I can't trust any of you guys. Right. Like, you guys got to all go. Yeah. And see, and that's what I didn't, what I didn't get until I started doing research for this. I just thought Coverdale was like, nah, I'm tired of you get away. But it really sounds like he thought they were all out to get him. And now of course, Sykes swears up and down. Well, I would never do that. I would never say that. But yeah, to your point, Sonny, I can imagine there was a time where it was like, we need, yeah, just pick somebody else and let's do this. Yeah. Well, the problem is David Coverdale's the founder and owner of the White Snake name. You can't just kick David Coverdale out of White Snake. You can kick anybody else out, but you can't kick him out. I mean, if he wants to go write songs with those other guys and find a new singer, that's fine. But, you know, it doesn't work that way, Sykes. So, you know, I don't know. But, I mean, they did great work when they were together. I mean, look, I, I like John Sykes. And I like the work that he did in Tiger's Pantang. Not a lot of people know that, know their music that well, at least not in the States. There's some folks over here who still remember it from the new wave of British heavy metal days. But, but John Sykes is fairly unknown in the U.S. to the casual rock fan. But he's a hell of a guitar player. And... He, he wrote all these songs, you know, which are all hits, basically. I mean, except for, uh, well, we'll get into the, the fine details, but he's all over this album. Yeah, and, and really a, a hell of a guitar player, too. And you wonder what would have happened had they had things gone smoothly into the future for Whitesnake. It was a little ahead of his time. I feel like yeah. Zach, Zach Wilde kind of caught wind of what, you know, got the wind that would have been in John Sykes' sales had he stayed with Whitesnake all this time. But, you know, that's... Because they have similar styles, but we, we can get into that. Yeah, and I think Sykes is one of those guys, okay, he's a hell of a guitar player. I'm not going to take that away from him. But whether it's Lizzie, whether it's Tigers, whether it's 
Blue Murder, whether it's his solo stuff. When you listen to that stuff, it's okay. It's okay. But it doesn't have the catchiness of White Snake. So he is Richie Sambora. He needs a John Bon Jovi to tame his ass down. There you go. To make mm-hmm. this stuff actual songs and not just guitar albums. And without <laughs> without Coverdale, he hasn't exactly done great for himself. No, that's true. Uh, absolutely true. You know, and yeah, you, you could be a master of that fretboard, be like Marty Friedman. You know, you put all this crazy stuff out, or even Steve Vai, who kind of stepped up after him in White Snake. You could say uh, it's amazing, but it's not all melodical. It's not all stuff you always want to listen to. I mean, it, you'd be like, "Wow, would you look at what that guy can do?" But you don't want to sit there and listen to it for half an hour, right? You know. Yeah, you're right. You need the hook, and you need the vocals. Um, it's, Sykes is actually a pretty good singer, but you're right. It, he it just lacks that, I don't even know what it is, that X factor of the singer, of, of a David Coverdale. And he is pitch perfect, man. I mean, he is on. You know, he, you may not like all of his songs. You may not like all of his lyrics. But listen to the way that the, the, the music comes out of his voice. It's so pure and smooth. He made Joe Elliott cry in the studio once because, you know, Joe's working with Butt Lang. He's like, okay, don't no, do that again. No, stop. Do it again. Do it again. Whereas... Coverdale just kind of does one take. That's good, Dave. You want to go to the next one? Yes, darling. Let's go to the next one. You know, it's just <laughs> always on, always ready to go. He's smooth on this one. I think it's the full package of, you know, you guys were talking about, let's say, like the Jaguar, right? If it's a Ferrari or a Porsche or a Lamborghini, then the guy is just a rock star a-hole that's right. flouting his money. Jaguar is class. Class. is sexy. Yeah. Right. And then you got the Englishman on top of that. Right. You got the lyrics on top of that. You got the R&B soul voice. There's sexiness oozing out of these songs. Mm-hmm. Same thing on Slide It In. Same thing on Saints and Sinners. Same thing on Slip of the Tongue. Like there was this 82 to 89 where you would think that Coverdale is the most sexed up guy on the planet and can sell it where everybody else is trying to sell it and they ain't selling it as good. Right. True. Yeah, even Motley Crue, who's all about girls, girls, girls. It's like, well, yeah, you go to the strip club. Of course, strippers like you. You know, I come away from the ATM machine. Strippers like me too. It's not that hard to get a stripper to like you. You know, right? But, I mean, you know, uh, maybe on the street. I don't know what you speak of. Yeah, I don't you know. know what you're talking <laughs> yeah. about. I, I bet Motley Crue does well better on the street with strippers than I do. But in the clubs, you know, we're all equal as long as you got the walk. And we've talked about this before. There's just something about the English attitude and the English gentleman persona you know you've got like you were talking about motley crew oh what's up dude we're gonna get all these chicks and blah 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 and then you talk to you know yes darling how are you today and it's just that (laughs) just that cool like you you just know you're cool it's under under a very reserved understated yeah just a just a rock star like if you walked in the room who was that dude yeah that's part of our show too sonny is like explaining why certain bands make it in the uk but they don't make it from the, in the u.s even if they're from the u.s you know and vice versa you know def leppard's a great you know a great example of that they have two diamond selling records in the U.S., you know, they barely have a platinum seller in the U.K. They can't get arrested over here, you know, whereas Oasis is the next Beatles in the U.K., whereas in America, like, yeah, they were out around the time of Hootie and the Blowfish, weren't they? Yeah, they had a couple of songs. Yeah, I kind of remember that. <laughs> and again, we kind of have this, we like what is imported. We like that English kind of classiness that Coverdale brings. And, then, you know, one of their videos when they're getting off the plane and they're wearing their suits and stuff like that. It's like, yeah, man, these guys look the part. They look cool. Whereas, you know, sometimes something that's cheesy in America, you export it and they're like, oh, it's American. Let's go buy the the next great American thing, which we don't really like, you know, in our hometown. So it's part of the dichotomy of UK, US. You think we're such good friends, but yet we're still very different. Yeah, like I'm into a lot of the new Sweden bands. And there is something about those guys that just kind of screams punk slash 80s slash melodic rock that for some reason, all the guys in the U.S. feel like they lost it. And I don't know, somehow Sweden has it. So it connects me to them. And maybe it's just I'm looking for a certain style of music and my home country isn't really doing that music. Yeah, well, I mean, we're lucky to get any kind of rock and roll for years there. We keep saying rock is dead. I'm like, it's not dead. People love it and young people will listen to it. A record company doesn't want to invest in four or five guys and hope that in the next 10 years they make three good albums. They want to get one good looking person, you know, who we can control 
control. We'll write the songs for them. We'll write the music for them. You know, we'll give them some dance moves. And this year we'll call her Megan Trainer, And next year we'll call her Billie Eilish. And the next year we'll call her Ariana Grande. You know, like, it's all disposable for them. But to get a band and nurture them and then hope they don't break up and find a sound like Rush, you could never have Rush today because they'd never get to their fourth album you know, where it was make or break. It's like the first one's no good. Ah, screw it. We'll just go get some pretty girl and, and put some backup singers behind her and we'll sell 10 million of those. What's crazy is you can't even self-fund it. So the Dead Daisies are trying to self-fund it and they can't cram it down your throats. Like it just doesn't work that way. Hey, this is Tom and Zeus from Shout It Out Loudcast. And you are listening to the Ugly American Werewolf in London Rock Podcast. Well, let's get in. Let's start doing this. Let's get into the track by track of this. And I guess we should do the U.S. version. But as I'm sure you guys are aware, there were two versions of this album. There was a European version, which had two more songs, clocking in at more than 53 minutes. And then the U.S. version was was nine songs, five of which were released as singles, and it clocked in, you know, 42, 43 minutes. So we'll we'll go in that order. But I'm going to point out along the way, because being here in the U.K., when I'm doing research for this, I go to YouTube. I could put in White Snake 1987. It automatically plays the European version. It doesn't automatically play the U.S. version, which I have somewhere in my CD collection, you know, in a storage facility, probably just around the corner from the Lost Ark of the Covenant there. All right. So, all right. So we, we get in with it. Starts with Crying in the Rain. And most all these songs are written by David Coverdale and John Sykes. This is Coverdale's solo, but it's also one he re-recorded. It was on Saints and Sinners. Is that right, Sonny? That is correct. Yeah. Saints and Sinners. That's right. So, yeah. Saints and Sinners. Now, in the European version, they start off with Still of the Night, which to me is awesome. We'll get to how much I love Still a Night. Sounds like you and I are on the same wavelength there, Sonny. But starting off with Crying in the Rain here, how do you feel about that? As far as, this is the way, we, you know, starting, kicking off the album is very important. Is this the song to do it with? Uh, I don't think it's a bad opener at all. I mean, they had really three songs, and we'll talk about all three, that could have opened the album. This is a more comfortable opening, and it kind of brings in the old fans with you because they've heard the song before. So if I have three great tracks I can open the album with, I most likely pick the one that's the most familiar to everyone everybody now i'll tell you the original has got zero punch it's super bluesy but it does not have the punch of the 87 version Mm -hmm. and sykes can say he hates the blues all he wants but there's no way to take the blues out of this song that's just how it is sykes kills it but uh, ansley and sykes doing this is unbelievable this is a great opening track yeah i would agree i think you could have started with still the night absolutely but this the way it kind of just punches in at the beginning I think it's pretty good. Do you know why they did this? I mean, was it a, was it a was it a record contract deal? Did they want did because sometimes they re-record stuff if the original contract was terrible and they're trying to get the rights back or something. But I mean, was there any reason for doing this, or they just love the song? Yeah. So what happened there is Kalodner had come up with the idea of doing "Here I Go Again" as a re-record, okay. and Sykes didn't like the idea at all. Coverdale's like, why would we want to do that? (laughs) And he goes, all right, I'll do it. But you know what? If we're going to do that, then I want to do Crying in the Rain too because I didn't like the way it recorded to begin with. So this was a, I'll do that if we can do this too. Gotcha. Got it. Okay. And that makes sense. You know, yeah, if you're going to go back and revisit, all right, we'll revisit one that I know that I can do better. You know, that I know we didn't get right the first time. Yeah, so that that makes sense. You know, for me, some of my notes were like, it, it's big riffs, big chorus. It fits the era very well. It, it's perfect for the record and, and what was going on in 87. The fiddly solo and some of the hammering that Sykes is doing here, it's great. But then I'm like, and it, it, 87, when I first heard it, I'd be like, oh my God, you know, can you hear this? It's kind of like Eddie Van Halen in some ways. Oh my God, isn't that so cool? But now it seems it's a little dated and even a little erratic, some of what he's doing here. It's like, is it really awesome? Because it was, yes, it opens the US version, but on the European version, it's buried. It's kind of fifth, you know, down there. So it's down away. So whoever was. A and R over here is like, nah, let's go ahead and slide that one down a bit. So I don't know. It's good and I think it could be better at the same time. 
I wrote down, it's funny you say that. I wrote down, sounds like he's noodling on the solo. Like, it's just like, give me something. Okay, how about this? Yeah, just, if you just, you needed a solo. You threw some stuff in. Could it have been him practicing? Who knows? Yeah, it just doesn't feel like it fits, especially when you listen to the rest of these tracks and the solos that are in, especially the big ones. Mm-hmm. This one just kind of sounds like it, it, it doesn't really fit. They needed something and they just kind of stuck it in there. Yeah, I, I see where you guys are going with this. And I've said it before myself, but I try to keep in mind it's 1985, 86 when he's doing this stuff, right? Does yeah. it get to l- release to 87? And there isn't Vi really on the scene yet. There isn't Zach Wilde on the scene yet. Yeah. Right. Eddie Van Halen hasn't gone full keyboard yet because right. that's still kind of happening, right? That's right. So if this was the last neuter you had, and everybody after this was Tom Kiefer, this would be the best thing since sliced bread. The problem is the noodling got bigger, right? right? Now you got Paul Gilbert. You got all these other guys coming going, oh my God, you can noodle and make it sound great. Like you don't have to do one or the other. That's why it hasn't aged well. But if this was the stop, this guy would be Randy Rhodes. No, I think we're all on the same page there. Yeah, absolutely. Like at the time, Wow, no, blown wow. away, so killer. You know, now it's like, yeah, you know, eh. I've heard better. Well, yeah, of course you've heard better. They've made a lot of great stuff since this, right? Yeah. All right, all right. Well, let's 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 walk along there because the next song, "Bad Boys," great name for a hard rock album. Number two on both versions here. It's thrashy as hell, boys. This is very thrashy. Considering at this point, I had not heard any Metallica. I didn't hear Metallica until Injustice for All, and that was still a year away at this point, yeah? Yeah, I'd say the same thing. I I, I had not experienced Metallica until that record came out, so yeah, it, this was, it was pretty hard, and it was a good, it's a nice second track, too. It kind of keeps the, the momentum going from the first song. Yeah, when people tell me, oh, this is John Sykes, you should go listen to Thin Lizzy. Dude, Thin Lizzy could not touch this. Mm. Right. I can't listen. I can maybe tolerate two Thin Lizzy songs like I cannot listen to Thin Lizzy. Right. So this could have easily opened the record. It yeah. punches you in the head immediately. And it's so simple. Right. Like Coverdale is not writing Steve Harris lyrics. Here, no. Right. They're very, <laughs> very simple. So they feel doable. Yeah. And that's the other way you sell eight million records is what you're doing. The girl seems unattainable, but man, if I sounded and looked like that guy, I can get her. That's and right. if I get her, I have a Jaguar because I'm making a lot of money. Yep. And homie's talking about sex, and I understand that. And he's <laughs> got cool dudes with him. I can get cool dudes with me. Like, it seems so doable that that's what is the total package, man. But this song is unbelievable. Yeah, it could have opened the – I absolutely agree with you, son. It could have opened the, the record with this very easily. It's not bluesy. So it fits in with Sykes, you know, it's heavy as hell, it's got the fast drums, great riff. And like, yeah, because of the lyrics, you know, this could have been on a Rat album, you know, if if Coverdale hadn't sung it. You know, this could easily fit in with other people of the time, you know. So it, it's very of the era, and I, I don't know, I, I'm a little surprised that it, I mean, because it's so different from the hits. Look at all the hits off this album, some of them are slower, some of them are power ballads some of them you know they're not super fast they may be heavy but they're not super fast this is thrashy this is almost like ahead of its time you know like we said metallica's and justice for all had not quite come out yet master of puppets had but i didn't hear that they didn't play that on the radio they didn't play it on mtv so i was unaware of it but this would have been kind of my introduction to something really thrashy right here yeah there's a uh, sykes live album where he does this song live Dude, he kills it live. So it's obvious to me that this is like an 80-20 type song, that John wrote 80% of this and Coverdale wrote the 20% kind of thing. Oh, I gotcha, yeah. Because it is different than other things on the album, and this would have never made Old White Snake. So right. it kind of feels like the coming of age, right? Because there's nothing on Slide It In like That's right. That's absolutely true. Yeah, yeah. Good call. All right, so third song at least on the U.S. version, is, to me, the big one, the first single and the first video off the record, Still of the Night. Oh, man. I, I, I can't tell you how much I love this, man. And, and honestly, it's because, of, it's because of the breakdown in the middle when they're about to go into the solo, and you've got, it's a cello, but in the video, 
Adrian Vandenberg has got his bow out, a la Jimmy Page. James Patrick Page, still my number one guitar hero of all time. And I'm like, and I was, and unlike you, Sonny, I already knew Led Zeppelin was worshiping them. So I'm like, oh my God, is he doing a Jimmy Page thing? How cool is that? This is the greatest thing ever. Now he's not doing it, but it looks good in the video, you know, and the video itself with the stage and Coverdale posing in front of the moon silhouette iconic dude such a big time song yeah this one is going to be this will last forever because it will be on every 80s movie forever any movie about the 80s or a spoof about the 80s generation hair metal this will show up over and over and over what i think i love the song I don't care if it's Zeppelin influenced. Yeah, Plant could do this. He probably can't sell the sex of it, but he could probably do the song. Okay, whatever. I don't care about all that. Right. I think the interesting story here is, so he's coming back from surgery and he's ready to go in the studio and he's ready to do some tracks finally after uh, you know a while and Sykes is pissed off. Everybody's pissed off. Keith Olsen says, all right, well, let's start with Still the Night. And Coverdale's like, are you nuts? He goes, just, I'm not going to hit record. Just try it a couple of times. Coverdale does two takes. Keith records them both. And a mix of the two takes is what you have on the album. That's it. So that is amazing, dude. <laughs> yeah. That's No wonder he made Elliot cry. I'd cry if somebody did that. <laughs> I know. Especially the end. Still in the night. Still in the night. You know, and the, the drums at the end, the guitars at the end. I'm like, this is awesome. This is not just a fade out, man. This is killer. They could play this for 10 minutes in concert and people would die for it. You know, it's awesome. What I love about this one is it's just the beginning part of it where it go, you know exactly what it is as soon as it comes on. And you're like, oh, here we go. I'm going to turn this up as, far, as loud as it'll go. And then they, he, they do that intro, like it, drop kind of. And then he goes into the lyrics and then they hit you with the main riff. It, it's fantastic. And then they have the breakdown in the middle. And then what I love too is that is as you're getting ready to, to get into the solo, it kind of builds and builds and builds. And I just wrote down it's that solo is it's not fast, but it's like blistering mm -hmm. when he gets when he gets into it. Like you're just pumped up when he when he goes into it. This song though, when you read the lyrics, because I'm stuck there. He doesn't technically have the woman and he's technically stalking, right? He's never actually been with this woman, right? Because it's my heart's beating heavy. I got to have more. My heart's aching. My body starts shaking. I got to, I just want to get close to you. I got to taste your love so sweet. He's heading, he's got his head down low. He wakes up the next day and does the same thing. He doesn't technically have her yet. But see, that's, that's, that's why it appeals to a bunch of young boys who don't have her yet, right? It's like, when I'm out looking for a woman, this is going to be my song, right? This is my mantra. This is how I go out stalking my prey, right? No, no, Sykes is awesome. This, But here's the thing, though, because as we were kind of talking about in the preamble, he had a hell of a band with Ansley Dunbar, who's played with everybody, is a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because of his time in Journey. Neil Murray on bass, played with Ozzy and, and John Sykes, not to mention Don Airy on keyboards, who's played with everybody. None of them are in the video, right? We've got video legends like Vivian Campbell, Dio, Thin Lizzy, eventually Def Leppard, and everybody's favorite Rudy Sarzo, who was in three great bands, didn't record the, the albums that he gets credit for, <laughs> he's in the videos for with any of them, but he's in all the videos. Of course, it's, it's hard to pick out Rudy at first, because for some reason... Rudy's blonde in yeah. this. How did Rudy Sarzo get to be blonde, you know? But Tommy Aldridge, who was in Black Oak, Arkansas, and just has been around a lot of bands over the years, plus Adrian Vanderberg, Vivian Campbell, uh, and Rudy, that makes the vid kids, the people who made all these videos, got to do this big tour, but didn't really record much. They, they The two guitars put a little bit into a couple songs, which we can get into, but other than that, they don't appear on the album, but they make history in the videos, along with... Miss Tawny Katane, who is, she's not, she, she's a little, uh, she's not, I'm not gonna say she's not sexy, because obviously she is, that's what she is, but, but they're not vamping her up too much, there's no contact between her and Coverdale really in this video, she's kind of from afar, he's looking at her through a gate or whatever kind of thing, versus the other videos, right, she's just, oh, let's put this hot woman in the video. By the way, do you know who they were going to put in this video? Yes, I do. Claudia Schiffer. Which wouldn't have been as good. I'm sorry. No, I agree with you. Yeah, I I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, because she's in the trilogy of videos, plus some on uh, on the next record, on Slip of the Tongue, 
And obviously she's so synonymous with, with Coverdale and the band at this point because of these videos. But I don't know, having another girl, Claudia Schiffer, who's bombshell beautiful and really kind of unknown then, I don't know. I, I'd like to see it. I, I'd like to see the version of it. I, I wish they had at least shot it and then said, no, she's not right, and then reshot it with Tony so I could see, I yeah. could compare the two. And it's not the beauty to me, right? Claudia is obviously beautiful. It's the slithering, mm. the swaying, the blindfold scream right right at the right time like there's this just guttural nastiness that comes off of tawny katane that ain't coming off claudia that is true that is true claudia's a runway model and looks how to pose and look great in black and white whereas tawny had dated robin crosby of rat and she was pretty much a groupie at this point that's how she got to meet david coverdale and eventually chuck finley and oj simpson and all the other people she dated over the years you know, she's kind of like a joint that gets passed around, you know, and it was David Coverdale's turn and Marty Callum, the uh, director, is like, oh, we can use her. She'll do just fine, you know, and yes, yeah, she has a, a sexiness and a sluttiness, I'll say, which just is perfect for this style of music and what they're trying to do with the video. The only problem is what you love about her is what's ultimately going to kill you. So when she's hanging out the uh, window of the Jaguar flashing you, fantastic you love it when she's trying to kill you with a six inch stiletto heel chuck finley <laughs> then you're like oh now i remember ha ah, yeah how did we get here hmm. or or remember she was in the news after she divorced dave and talking about his two inch or three inch and she was yeah. all kinds of nastiness not nice <laughs> yeah no so jackson and i of course we're big jimmy page fans and when we were living together in college Coverdale Page came out and then they were touring. They were touring on the Coverdale Page album and they were booked to come to the Orlando Arena. We had tickets and then eventually they canceled the show. And I think it was because they just, you know, they, they weren't selling anything in the upper deck and the lower wasn't, you know, selling the way they really wanted to anyway. But the rumor started that because Tawny was in Orlando filming, you know, one of those America's home videos or you know not the bob saget one but one of those ripoff shows like because she's in the area they decided to cancel the show so he wouldn't have to bump into her I'm like that's got nothing to do with it it's it's not a huge town but it's big enough that they could stay apart for the one night he was there it's because they simply didn't sell out and they didn't want to be embarrassed yeah nobody can get backstage without somebody letting them in and right. nobody can get on stage without somebody letting them in. So come on, dude, really? That's a joke. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's not it. It's like they just didn't sell enough tickets. And I wish we kept the tickets instead of trading them in for money. But, you know, when you're in college, 32 bucks goes a long way. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, that was gold. Yeah. yeah, you're right. That would have been nice to have today. But, yeah, that was that was several hundred dollars back then. <laughs> that's right. That's right. All right, let's move on because next is – Big one, the big one, boys. Here I go again. Number one hit single, second release off the record. And another rewrite that he'd done with Bernie back on Saints and Sinners, you know. And you're right, Sonny. It's uh, it's not just, it, it's it's very different. Because I didn't, I had to go back and listen to it. Like, is it really different? Or did they just kind of clean it up, give it a 1987 polish? It is different. You know, and Sykes did put his flavor on it which helped make it such a huge hit yeah and we know sykes didn't do the guitar solo right he was pissed about doing this rewrite. right he didn't want to do it mm -hmm. and i don't know if he thought that it would be a hit or it's just i don't want one of my songs to be off the album and possibly make less money right so you know we kind of talked about neil murray and ansley and don you can't ask them to stay on even if coverdale doesn't get rid of them or they leave on their own and some of those guys left on their own sure they didn't write any of these songs. So right. the reality of the situation is they know Sykes has got money coming. They don't have any money coming unless right. they're touring. Right. So they're like, we don't know what's going to happen. Right. But I'm telling you this, you want to talk about a hummable song that you hear at the mall on Muzak yep. in elevators, kids bop. Like it's like jump. It's going to be everywhere forever because it can be. And if you think it got lucky, so I, I saw the t I looked at the top five when it was number one. Okay. If you think it got lucky, number five at the time, you got to look Prince. Wow. Number four, I heard a rumor, Banana Rama. <laughs> number three was Carry by Europe. Number oh, wow. two was Lost in Emotion by Lisa Lisa and the Cult Jam. And then the next week, Lisa Lisa went number one. So didn't exactly get lucky. 
like it's a great song it's a great video and it's it's uh and the radio version was a little more pop right mm, so they did a good job terrible. of these different versions like get it played everywhere don't worry about it you know it's, this is one of those songs like we talk about pour some sugar on me from Def Leppard I've never I don't know any White Snake songs I've never heard of them before you put that one on. oh yeah I know I love that song I've heard that a million times yep. of course you have yeah no and it's okay to change it a little bit for a single edit I mean look on the record still the night is more than six and a half minutes long you're not going to have a single at six and a half minutes. So they cut it down to maybe four and a half or something like that for this, or maybe even down to four for the single. So if here I go again, if they need to switch that up a little bit to get it on the radio again, you know, I, that's fine. And I'm going to buy the album anyway, so I'm going to get the full version. It doesn't matter to me, but you know, let, let other people who only consume it via the radio hear it and then get into it that way. I don't know. I mean, sometimes I hate it. Like when they, when they have uh, don't fear the reaper by blue oyster cult, by the way, way to put, Burning for you on Jasmine's playlist. Love the BOC, Sonny. And I could have gone in a little deeper on that song with you two on that, but that's a story for another day. But sometimes, you know, because there was a single edit version of Don't Fear the Reaper that basically takes out the entire crazy solo in the middle. I'm like, but dude, that's the song. I mean, that's, you know, the, the breakdown and coming back all huge like that. And then you come back with the final lyrics that matches the beginning. That's the song. Like, you can't just cut it off like that. So. You know, small changes I'm in favor of. Yeah, and I know I knew that the Sinners and Saints version was out there, but I think I guess I'd never really heard it. And one time it came on the radio, and I'm like, what is this? <laughs> this doesn't sound anything like that. So he, they changed it up. They changed the lyrics. Yeah, I think it was one of those uh, Kalodner deals where he wanted he he needed a hit, and he thought this was going to be it. Yeah, originally it wasn't even going to be on Saint Sinners. So Coverdale has said in interviews. Uh, you know, he was hammered all the time, drinking like nobody's business. His original marriage is on the rocks. Band members are fighting. Like it wasn't even going to make Saint and Sinners. If it doesn't make that, it probably doesn't make this album. Right. Right. Because I think Kaladner he heard something going, you can make that better and it will fit what's out there right now on the radio. Good and call. I think, wasn't this, wasn't this one of those deals where like Coverdale, I mean, I know it's credited to both Coverdale and Bernie Marsden, but isn't it one of those things where Bernie says he wrote it, he came up with the original and Coverdale says, no, 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 I wrote this because of a breakup. And well, didn't he knows? say, no, but then he said it was something that he and Blackmore had worked on way back in the day, but then it was so unrecognizable from, from what he and Bernie eventually did that he didn't have to give Richie any credit, you know? So yeah, it's kind of, you get four different stories, right? Yeah. <laughs> this video is unbelievable, right? Huge. So you got, okay. You got Tawny doing the gymnastics or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. And then she's hanging out of the Jaguar, like a dog would hang out their yes. neck or whatever. <laughs> and so I send it to you guys. So at mm -hmm. two nineteen, when she's coming out of the car, she's not wearing a bra. So there is a nipple showing. So freeze it at 219. It's there. I'm telling you. Yeah, exactly. No, and I did. I looked really closely just to make sure you were right because I have to verify things on our show. That's what I do. I'm research. The, I'm the fact checker. Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> Sonny says there's a bare nipple at 219. It's going to be frozen at 217, 218, 220. Just, you know, just to see. But no, you're right. So it means MTV was showing bare nipples back then. <laughs> this is an iconic video for so many reasons. Her dancing on the Jaguars, her with her wild hair and his wild hair meeting together. And she's singing it too. She's smiling in the camera. Here I go again in her green. Oh my God. You know, and then she's pulling him into the back, you know, while he's driving, like that's dangerous. You know, I mean, hanging out the window is one thing, but you don't pull the driver into the back. It's a great way to, to get hurt, you know, but no, even Paula Abdul, I think they brought to the set to say, well, let's teach Tawny because they only took Tawny the first time because like Claudia fell through and like, all right, she's hot. She'll do. She's been on some rat covers. We, we can use her. And Paula Abdul was like, no, I don't need to teach her anything. She knows how to move. I'm like, yes, she knows how to move. Why do, <laughs> why do you think these rock stars all hang out with her? And they, she's basically the new Pamela DeBar. She gets to go from one to the next, right? So, but no, that is dangerous. Don't, please don't try that at home. Please don't try reenacting this video at home, kids. But here's the thing on the European version, there are only nine songs on the US version. This is song number 10 on the European version. So you had to listen to the whole record, basically, before you even got to this. So European A&R must not have thought much about this one. You know, and it, was, it did fine over here in Europe. I mean, I think it went platinum as a single 
here in uh, here in the UK, but uh, but not like not like being when you're number one in America. That's enormous, dude. That that's so huge for airplay, for record sales. That is money and fame and eternity. Let's go look at Will Ferrell in old school with the Red Dragon. You know, revving it up to here I go again, man. It's it's always going to be a part of pop culture. Well, that's an interesting deal too because it, it's two different. Really, it's just two different albums. Like the U.S. version was Geffen, and then the European version was something else. It was on a different record company. So I wonder if that's, you know, like you said, it's just two different A&R people, the two people attacking this thing two separate ways and not coming up with the same answer. Yeah. And the video. So can you imagine like, okay, so you're directing this video. You got Tawny doing what she's doing. Fine. You got Dave with her. That's fine. You tell Dave, do some mic stand moves. I guess you tell Rudy, lick a bunch of stuff. Right. You told, you tell Adrian, Tell Adrian, do a bunch of twirls. You tell Vivian, hey, you know what? Just way back and forth. Don't do much. You <laughs> tell Tommy, just to twirl sticks. And you kind of just flash to this vid kids that are doing all these things. I thought, I'm like, is everybody supposed to lick their bass? Like, I'm 18 <laughs> years old when this is happening. <laughs> I, I'm like, I've licked a bass. It doesn't play like that. You have to actually play it too. Oh, it's so funny. It's so good. It's so true too, you know. But here's the thing. I mean, we take MTV for granted. Most people over here in the UK in 97 did not have MTV. And maybe you would see them on top of the pop. So if it got into the top 40, maybe they would play the video that week. Maybe, you know, and I think there's a couple other video shows over here, but not everybody had MTV. We took it for granted. I mean, in 1981, maybe only 30% of the people had it, but by summer of 1982, it was like 98%. Like if you had cable, you had MTV, you had to, you know, everybody was clamoring for it, you know, whereas in Europe, and in England, like, yeah, we let's just sit sit and wait about that. Eh, I don't know about that just yet. So it sits on the shelf and it's and that's another big reason why some things hit huge in the US, but they don't hit big over here. Like another Geffen, John Collagner, great band, Asia, who Gary and I talk about, Mike Stone, who produced some of the songs on this record, produced Asia, right? So Collagner and Mike Stone get Asia together. They're big here. In a, rather, they're big in America. They're nothing over here. You know, I've sat with Asia's PR person. She's like, in 82, I didn't even know who they were. I loved, yes, but I had no idea who Asia were, you know? So it's just the way it is. Now, speaking of production real quick on this one, is, isn't there some, there's a rumor that actually Bob Rock came in uncredited to mess with Sykes' guitar sound? Because he was, he was, I think he was friends with Claudner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think Sykes was trying to get a specific guitar sound, and he couldn't quite figure it out. And Bob helped. What I was going to say is, what's interesting with this thing, and you know, we haven't talked about it yet, but this whole thing about changing the word hobo to drifter, so right. people didn't think that Coverdale was saying homo. Now, what's interesting is, so the licking's okay. Right. The band name about your Johnson's okay. Right. The whole pulling the mic stand off your crotch is okay. <sighs> the showing the nipples okay. The girl pulling you back into the car and the car crashes is okay. And you s- basically oozing sexiness is okay, but you want to make sure nobody thinks you say homo? Correct. Well, I mean, you want to be a hit in America in the Reagan era? You better <laughs> leave that homo stuff out. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, the, the and the other the other funny thing too is they were talking about that, but I'm like, when you hear the original version, like hobo, is this 1925? <laughs> who uses that word anymore? What? So you jump on a train to yeah, exactly. Kansas with City, the, you know? <laughs> yeah, with the stick with the red bandana on the end. Like, what are we doing? Right, exactly. And Drifter does point Drifter. You, you can, I obviously the lyrics famous to all of us. Like a drifter, I was born like a hobo. It just doesn't sound right, even if you don't. Even that homo doesn't come into your brain, which it probably wouldn't for me. A drifter just sounds so much better. I mean, being a drifter, well, this he's an outlaw, right? He's doing his own thing. Hobo's like right. he's got no job. He's unshaven. He smells bad. You know, it's. <laughs> It's to me, it's more of an image thing that's like, oh, I hope they don't think I'm gay. Thing, yeah, you're right. Drifter does sound a little more like it could be badass, like, you know what? I don't play by my own rules, I kind of just go where I please. Yeah, hobo's like, man, I hope I get a sandwich today. Yeah, a a drifter is a no bad or a vagabond, a a, a hobo is a homeless guy who smells bad and hasn't had a (laughs) job. You know, it's it's different. (laughs) And I know we're just talking about words here, but you know, you could talk about the albums too, like if you had, like I did. I had the U.S. version of Slide It In, 
Because mm-hmm. to me, the European version is unlistenable. Anytime okay. it comes on, I got to shut it off. Nice. I had, you know, the US version of this, and I, I get into slip of the tongue before I go backwards. Okay. If you get stuck with those three albums, it is tough to listen to old White Snake because it's like, oh my God, this is not what I'm used to listening to. It's not the same. So you yeah. have to basically assume it's a different if it's a different band. Otherwise, I'll tell you, stuff like even Stains and Sinners. It's a love hunter. It's almost unlistenable because after you listen to this, it's hard. Love hunter is yeah, totally right. different. Yeah, totally yeah. Different. Because if you go, if you go to to uh, to slip of the tongue, they do fool for your loving, and that's totally yeah. different. To- it's it, oh. they they redo it in the rock era, you know, with the Steve Vai solo, and yeah, it, you're right. The other stuff is like, oh yeah, <laughs> swing and a miss. For us, anyway. Yeah. All right. Well, that's that's look. That's a huge hit. Obviously, huge in America, huge around the world. Iconic. Let's get to the fifth song here, which is "Give Me All Your Love." Give me all your love tonight. Did I review this? There it is. Okay. Because it's it's the third song off the European version. Obviously, they thought a little bit more of it here. Fourth single, but I don't know. What, what did you guys think of this one? Because. The video wasn't in the Tawny vein. It's a little more rocking. It's not, I wouldn't call it a power ballad. I call it a rock song that has love in it. Eh, what do you think, Sonny? I think it's a great song. It's super catchy. If you don't have things like Here I Go Again or Still of the Night, this thing does a little bit better because I think it gets pushed a little more with the real video. Now, I'll tell you that I watched the video the other day and I'm like, what the hell is that solo? And I forgot. Vivian did the solo on the video, but it's a psych solo that's on the album. It's right. psych solo smokes Vivian solo. So to me, super catchy, but dude, the lyrics. So the lyrics about this crazy chick that you want, and I'm talking crazy, like public nudity, public sex may show you a thing here. I'm not talking like bank robber, kill people crazy. Right. I'm talking about, you know, the other crazy, the right. like you crazy, not the throw a heel at you crazy. You right, know, right. That, you know. But the, the, lyri- the lyrics are so simple. It just makes you, and I, I, I try to be a musician. I wasn't a great one, but I, so I landed at lyrics. So it felt like I could tell a story better. And when you read stuff like this, it's just like, God, anybody could write this. It's just, <laughs> you got to be creative enough and think about it. And there's, Think about timing, I guess. That's right. I'm I'm in the same I'm in the same boat with you. I forget that the video does not track with the album, and so yeah, you, the rest of the song is pretty much exactly the same, except for that Vivian yeah. Campbell solo. I love Vivian Campbell; it's atrocious. The John Sykes solo is phenomenal, and you're right. This if you take out the lyrics, it's a great song. It's almost like. I'll listen to the music and kind of push the lyrics out because you're right. Anybody could have done that. It's a rock and tune. I think th- this is probably one. This is number either one or two solo on the record for me from John Sykes. Yeah, no, Sykes stands out here. It, and it's the only thing that Vivian ever recorded for White Snake, right? Because he, he he came in to do the tour, but it's like, okay, no, we got to do the video. They, they change up the solo. So that's him. You're right. It's not. Not his best effort, and it and it pales in comparison to what Sykes did do, and you know it's it shows them coming off the plane, going to the show, like they're rock stars now versus the you know Tawny being slutty all around them kind of thing. So, um, you know, I guess they wanted to change that up, or what was probably like, all right, we're gonna pay for three videos. But that's it. And then the album continues to do well and the hits really take off. It's like, okay, we're going to need a fourth. So why don't we do a concert one? I think they filmed that like at the Meadowlands when they did a concert yeah. there. Mm-hmm. Jackson, I, I don't know. The soloing had lots of flash. I don't know how meaningful it was like within the parameters of the song, but I'm like, it's a great solo. I, but like you say, I mean, it's, you know, the lyrics are easy. They're not, <laughs> I don't say they're cheesy, but it's like they don't really stand out. It's like this kind of fits with the era, it fits on the record, but it's not like, I, I remember hearing it on the radio, but it's not like I can't wait to hear Give Me All Your Love Tonight. But then I hear it, it comes on, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm start tapping my toe and bopping my head. I'm like, yeah, I remember this one. This is all right. It was almost like they had the song and they were like, hey, we need some lyrics for this. <laughs> uh, okay, give me four minutes and I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know your name. I can't leave you alone. I'm running like a around in circles, like a dog without a bone. Sounds hey, good. Go. It rhymes. Go. Right. Use it. You want to do a second take, David? No, that's good. Go to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Is this love? In a way, this was almost bigger than Here I Go Again. It, it wasn't. It, it didn't end up 
kind of being that kind of cultural touchstone that everybody remembers and puts in movies and stuff like that today. But because Is This Love is a power ballad, if there ever was one, you know, and it's the triumvirate of Tawny, you know, being all slutty and everything. And this is at her very, very sluttiest, right? This is, you know, the first one's still the night. She was from afar, didn't really see her all that much. The second one, okay, they're hopping around on a car and in a car together. But this one is her barely clad, dancing for him in the bed. This is more than just PG-13. Like, they might not have played this in Alabama until 9 o'clock at night. You know what I mean? Yeah, originally, this song was written, I think, for Tina Turner or somebody. Or it was written for Geffen. And then, and then Coverdale and Sykes were like, no, I think we're going to go ahead and keep this one. So not I, not originally a White Snake song, but then they, and I don't know what the version was that they were thinking, but I mean, it, it, thinking of giving to Geffen, but I think it, it sounds great. And you're right. It, Tawny is just, it, especially for a, what, how old were we? 13, 14 at that point in time. Holy Christmas. Wow. Yeah, Mac, I would tell you this album is almost like a porn soundtrack <laughs> hidden in pop rock songs. A little bit, yeah. Right? And yeah. even in the video, when Coverdale's like looking at the camera, it's like looking to your eyes like everybody's a piece of meat. Mm -hmm. Like anybody who comes by, he's going to do kind of thing. Right? <laughs> it's amazing. It's true. I love the song because Coverdale's rasp completely disappears. And the R&B and the soul in his voice comes out in this song. I can understand, yes, you're going up against George Michael's faith. Right. Otherwise, this thing's number one. Right. There's no doubt in my mind about it. right? And it kept the album going. And this really probably sold the last two, three million copies. Yeah. Because this was the song that I think, like, if you're going to hand a song to Tina Turner, I'm sure not just every schmo can write a song for Tina Turner, right? She mm -hmm. was hot at the time. Everything she was touching was gold. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. No, no, no. He, and Eddie Trunk, it's on his pre roll in his, in his podcast. Like, originally, I wrote that song for Tina Turner. You can hear him say that, you know? Yeah. And yes, he did, you know? Yeah. But they make it work really well. And let's face it, guys, mostly guys like us, testosterone fueled guys, are buying hard rock albums because of stuff like Still of the Night and Here I Go Again and Bad Boys and stuff like that. But as soon as you put this on there, your audience suddenly doubles, right? So if you've sold three or four million copies and the girl's like, yeah, I know that song my boyfriend likes. Oh, I know that song, yeah. But suddenly you've got a ballad. Now they've got an excuse to go out and buy the record as well because they already know a couple more. It's like, oh, and they've got that pretty one on there I like. You know, it's like Home Sweet Home for Motley Crue or Silent Lucidity for Queensryche. It's like, you know, you get them in there with the, the ballad and your audience can double overnight. Right, and, and we've talked about this before. It's nice to have something that you can put on the turntable when the missus comes over and not screaming for vengeance. Well, that's right. Yeah. And I'll tell you, what, for all the noodling, that Sykes is doing on this album. To me, this is his best solo because it is so restrained mm -hmm. and it is absolutely beautiful made for radio. Yeah, I would I would say it's either this or I, I would say, yeah, this is probably number one. And that and that bass line is just pumping through the whole thing. And he just kind of floats on top of that. Yeah, it, it, this is a really good track. Uh, regardless of what you think of the album or the genre or anything else. And I think if Sykes was with us right now, the question we would ask is, is this why you didn't want to do Here I Go Again? Did you think this was the number one song? Interesting. Maybe. Oh, yeah, maybe so. Didn't think about that, but yeah, you're right. And of course, Adrian Vandenberg did do the solo just to kind of dot our I's and cross our T's there. He did do the solo. Only thing he did on this not album. in this song. No, no, I'm sorry. On here I go again. Here on here I go again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That, on the '87 version of Here I Go. No, you're right. Not on this song. And obviously he he did make the next record with them as well. But the only thing on the album he did was yeah. Here I Go Again. That's right. But that's a good yeah. point. Maybe Sonny did he think I don't need to do Here I Go Again because first of all I don't like to do blues. Secondly, this is the hit anyway, and still the night's the killer riff one. So I got both my bases covered, right? Right, and it's my song, and I don't have to, and I don't get uh, frozen out of royalties. Yeah, and he's looking at it going, we have a wanted dead or alive a bringing on the heartbreak what the hell are you guys doing don't add that other song 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Look, the video, I mean, if Cinemax ran like 30 minutes with the videos, you know, between like Playboy or you know, the, the, basically the excuses they run late at night so teenage boys can get a look at some boobs or whatever, if they ran videos, this would have been one of those videos that they ran like at 1130 at night because it's just, it's sexy and Tawny hopping around in a negligee and just, you see her packing up and, and like, she's just packing up like bras and panties and like stuff that takes up no space. Like, why do you even need a, a suitcase? You can pack that up in your purse, you know? She's all mad she's leaving, but not at the end. <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of looked at it as I was watching the video the other day and I'm thinking, okay, I'm probably thinking this a little too deep and giving Coverdale a little too much credit, but it's like, is this song about, am I feeling lust? Or am I feeling love right now? That's probably a little too deep, but it does work if you start thinking about it that way. Huh. Well, I mean, the whole thing didn't last that long. So who knows? Because they were only married for, what, like a year or two? Well, I don't know. In 80s rock stardom, that's pretty good. And, you know, they, they were together for a year or two <laughs> In dog that. years. Yeah, you know. In Tawny Katane <laughs> years, it's a very <laughs> long time. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, wow. indeed. Yeah. And Is This Love, number six on both. It's, it's another one that was the same on both the European and the U.S. versions. The next three, they, they kind of mix up. You know, it goes on the U.S., Children of the Night, Straight for the Heart, Don't Turn Away. On the European version, it's Straight for the Heart, Don't Turn Away, Children of the Night. So it's it's these same three, just maybe in a slightly different order. And for me, this is where it kind of starts to kind of starts to to slow down a little bit. Like, you know, we, we've we've hit our big ones. We've got our big hits. We've got stuff that are going to move the needle a little bit. But, you know, eh, I don't know. Children of the Night, this is not my favorite on the album. What, what do you guys think? Well, it's, it's tough, and we've talked about this before. I mean, you go through, you had the first two songs. Then if you were listening to this album all the way through, you've got Still of the Night, Here I Go Again, Give Me All Your Love, Is This Love? No matter what comes after that, unless it's another number one hit, it's going to fall off. And so that it kind of, I think it kind of suffers from the, you're getting to the end of the album blues. This, and this is the one to me that almost sounds most like old school White Snake too. Yeah. I love all the songs on this album, but uh, you guys are exactly right. You know, after you get <laughs> basically two number one hits really. Yeah. And then you get to this song, you know, it's tough to compare. Now it depends if this thing was a jingle. For like e harmony, so think about it. That little "Don't hide what you feel inside, don't let anything stand in your way." That could be an e harmony jingle, and you would hear this every day for two and a half years. <laughs> You'd probably be humming it all the time. <laughs> Maybe right, because so. that little piece of this song is very pop, but it doesn't yeah. really match the heaviness of the rest of the song, exactly. which is a little interesting because it's like two things jammed together. And then you got Sykes basically playing as fast as he can. I don't know if he's trying to piss Ingve off or whatever, but he's right. basically playing as fast as he possibly can. <laughs> no, you're right. No big riff at the beginning. And then here come the drums after that. And then we're off. It's almost like an Iron Maiden runner at the beginning of this thing, you know, but then the, the lyrics are, are you ready to rock? Children of the night, are you ready to roll? <laughs> Children of the night, how long did it take you to write those, Dave? You know, I mean, I could have smoked three joints and written that. And, and then, although some heavy guitar work from Sykes, some crazy stuff, but does it sound great? Or is it just like, look at what I can do? You know, I just, they go to slow down for slow. It's just, it's to me, it's just not a great song. It fits, but it's just like, it, you know, in the day of CDs, this is one that's going to get skipped, if not from the beginning, after after a couple of minutes here. But, but what's next there? Straight for the heart, Jackson. What yeah. is your what's your take on really, straight? Uh, it, to me, I know, Sonny, you said you love them all. This is where it really starts to hit the skids for me because this sounds like every other cheesy mid '80s. Anybody could have done this. It could have been a journey rec- a journey track off of raised on radio or something like that. I mean, it's not it, the rest of the stuff that you had on this record. This just sounds like you kind of were, you just kind of gave up like, mm, here's something to put on here. It just sounds, it just sounds generic to me. Yeah. To me, all those generic albums, I absolutely love them all. That's the thing. Because it came all in my teen years, right? Yeah. You're talking 84 to 89, anything that was coming, I was consuming. And this fits absolutely straight into the middle of that. And Sykes absolutely makes a song, even though it's not super edgy and the synth kind of calms it down a little bit and it's a little more Bon Jovi, Sykes is making the song. 
I can do without the hard how a lot or whatever he's doing there. That <laughs> that that's a little weird, but besides that, um, yeah, it's a simple right that fits the time, and it's just like everything else I was listening to. So I love it. Yeah, and it's upbeat. It's an upbeat track, right? It's not like a yeah. down blues. So it, it's upbeat. The, the keyboard kind of turns me off. I, I think my notes are a lot like you, Gary. It's like pop hooks. Not super original. Sounds like something off an 80s soundtrack. But that's not all negative, is it, Sonny? When you love those 80s soundtracks, right? When that, when, when you love it all, it's like, yeah, that's not all bad. But it's a feel-good song that doesn't feel that good to me. It's the, it's the way I kind of put it at the end. You know, Stand and deliver in the name of love. Yeah, I'm going to sit down, I think. Yeah, thanks, though. But, you, gotta, you know, it, it's, it, it could be worse. And then Don't Turn Away. Yeah, it doesn't stand out to me after the rest of them. But, I mean, that's kind of where we yeah. are. We're, we're, we're kind of finishing with a whimper instead of finishing yeah, with a back. I would agree. I, I think these two, Straight from the Heart uh, and Don't Turn Away, I mean, again, there's nothing There's nothing wrong with them. They're, not, they're just kind of generic. And I think that for what you had on the rest of this record, it's kind of almost a little bit of a letdown to me. Yeah, and I don't know if you need a third ballad. Right. It's basically a ballad. And it's one thing to have a ballad about a lost love or, you know, you lost somebody that was close to you that passed away or you're thinking about love. But a ballad about sexual frustration (laughs) is a little bit interesting. (laughs) Right. Like she's going through all this stuff. But all I want to do is make love to you is basically what he says on this thing. Right. So that's a little weird. Right. <laughs> I, I like the song because it's written well and it's a movie soundtrack theme, basically. Yeah. But those two yeah. songs that are on that European version that we'll get to, I would have taken either one of those two songs over this one. I, I'm with you there. My, my notes were same keyboard, same polished sound, same string bending. Yeah. Um, it, it just doesn't stand out. It fits, but it's it's generic, you know, and it fades out at the end. You know, it, it's just, it's almost like it's a throwaway song. And it's, I can't believe Kalodner liked this better than he liked, because it was Kalodner's choice for the American version. He liked this more than Looking for Love and better than You're Going to Break My Heart, which both ended up in the European version. So that was surprising to me. It's like Kalodner's not just doesn't have the Midas touch for everything. He doesn't get everything. Because I think he was wrong about that one. I would have taken, I'm with you, Sonny, either of those songs over this one. This This was like... We need one more. You got anything? Great. Slap it on there. We got to ship this thing. Yeah. Coverdale has said in interviews, he was surprised Children of the Night made the album that Looking for Love should have made it. I can imagine Kalodner saying, of course you like Looking for Love. It sounds like old Whitesnake, you know, the ones that you didn't sell and you still have 10,000 right. copies of in your basement. <laughs> it's that White Snake. That's why we're not putting this on the record. What, get, what gets me is you're going to break my heart again. Because to me, that's better than crying in the rain to me. I absolutely love that song. That song had a chance to be a top 20 hit. So you're going love to break my so heart high. again? You think that that should have been yeah. and been uh, a single too, huh? Yeah, yeah. I love that song. I don't know. To that one, I mean, like, it fits in. It, it fits in perfect on the record. They should have had it on the U.S. version, in my opinion. And, you know, I mean, if you're cruising around town in your I Rock Z in 1988 and you've got your cassette in there, you know, you know, you don't want to rewind and fast forward. You want everything to have a similar sound so you can just crank it. Maybe you turn it up louder for the bigger hits or whatever. But I don't know. It just it, to me, it's good playing and it fits and it just kind of ended. That song just kind of and it was over and it was like, ah, well, it's, I don't know if they really finished that or if it's like ah, we don't need 11 songs. Just just hurry up. We got to get it done kind of thing. I don't know. But to me. The, the one that they really should have put on there was Looking for Love. It's slowed down. It's not a ballad, maybe a power ballad. It's a little bit like Love Bites. It would have, you know, by Def Leppard. It's kind of got a little bit of that quality to it. Coverdale liked it. Collider didn't. It was too long to have been a single, but it could have been edited just like Still of the Night was. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I feel like that was a miss, leaving Looking for Love off the North American version. Yeah, I agree with you. Listening to that, if you, if you go back to, like, iTunes, they do put the... Uh the other two tracks on there. And yeah, it, it seems like they kind of fell off and then that one came back in. So yeah, kind of a head scratcher on why they did not include that. Yeah. And there's not very many albums uh, that I have heard that. Uh, so the U S version is desert Island for me. Mm-hmm. Like this is one of the best albums of my lifetime. And then to have two other songs that would have still made it a desert Island album, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's like, Oh my God, you guys hit on 11 amazing songs. Yeah, because they still fit in. It's still very much the same sound. It's not like 
we were trying something different or we did this cover song and oh it's not too bad no it's original it sounds like the rest of it it sounds of the era and if you liked songs six through nine you would like songs 10 and 11 too you know it's just those songs one through five are so huge right they're so iconic and and, and, and move the needle forward, whereas like the, the last few songs of the album, it's like, yeah, they're of the era, but yeah, you know, we just, we needed another 20 minutes, basically, or whatever, we need another 15 minutes for the album. Fair. And then you get to the cover art, too. It didn't have the white snake with the white snake on it. They went to Canadian Hugh Syme, who's done a lot of Rush covers, who we are huge fans of on this show, and kind of gave him a new... 2.0 look, right? Something kind of refined. It's marble. It's kind of got this gold stamp. It's got a little Latin on there. WS. Kind of put them in a new stratosphere. We're not just down-home blues people. We are kind of have a certain air about us now. I mean, it must have looked good, you know, on the new albums rack in Target back in the day, Sonny. Yeah, the album cover, first of all, Slide It In, is one of my favorite album covers of all time. Love Hunter. Good mm-hmm. Lord. I mean, those are awesome album covers, right? So this album cover, it, it reminds me of two things. One is I stay at Caesars a lot in Vegas, and mm. you could literally put a faucet in the middle of that thing, and this would be the shower. Like that's <laughs> kind of the crackle, right? Yeah, right. marble again. Yeah, the absolutely. other thing, the other thing it reminds me of is National Treasure. It feels like that white that WS you would just turn it and push it, and like a door would open. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Right. The secret so love super chamber. Simple. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> super simple, and it allowed them to basically not have to have the band's picture on the front or back so you can change the band member. So my guess is this decision is made when Dave's thinking, uh, I'm not going to have the same band member. So we probably, if we're going to have pictures on the inside, whatever, but the outsides probably can't have these guys because I don't think they're going to be in my band. That's right. And, and come up with a logo. And then the logo is eternal, right? And because people always change it and yeah. out of bands, but you got a logo. And whoever's, you know, playing guitar, playing drums, we've got this new white snake emblem that is iconic now. So, yeah. Did you ever see, have you ever seen them? Did you see them on this tour? Have you ever seen White Snake live? I have seen White Snake live many times. I mm-hmm. saw them on this tour three times. So I know all the tour dates. I have most of them written down, but I saw the, the Motley Crue tour at Oakland Stadium in 87. Wow. And then I saw them, a great white open for them on two different dates, one in April and one in June, one time in the Bay Area and then one time in Sacramento. So the beauty of living in the Bay Area is I could see bands in LA, I could see them in Bakersfield, Fresno, Sacramento, right? So I, I could even go to Reno if I wanted to, it was only three hours away, right. San Jose. So a lot of these guys were bouncing it out. And then I saw them a couple of times with uh, Bad English during the next tour and then saw them 13 years later and they still rock playing with scorpions right so that's awesome i mean they were great live in the day there's and steve vai's my favorite guitar player so there was no way when when steve vai joins i'm like oh this is even better <laughs> i know i remember when steve vai joined i'm like oh they're just up in their game aren't they i mean they just went from having you know a couple of badass shredders i didn't even really know john sykes at the time because he wasn't in the videos right and i didn't know tigers of pantang so i wasn't aware of him but I did know that who Steve Vai was. I'm like, oh, and now they're adding Steve Vai. How awesome is this going to be? Now, Slip of the Tongue's got some killer stuff on it, but some of Vai's stuff, it just doesn't seem to match. It doesn't match the bluesier stuff they did back in the day and didn't even necessarily match some of the John Sykes magic they had on the 1987 album. Is that heresy, Jackson? Or is it like, I just don't know what a great match he was for them. Awesome, yeah. yes, but match? I'm yeah. not sure. And and I know that was a big bone of contention with Vandenberg because he something happened to him. He screwed his hand up or something. So he had to bow out and then they brought Vi in and he kind of he came in and reworked some stuff that Vandenberg did not like. Yeah, there are there are a couple of things where it's like that doesn't really fit, but it's Steve Vi. So just do it. It's cool. But yeah, it is a yeah. match. I don't know. Right. Right. Yeah. That that album. I mean, we could do a whole we could do a whole other show on that album. But it, it, yeah, it was, it was a little bit different. I think that he, he was kind of a big, kind of a, well, to me, he was a big star too. So I'm like, how is this going to work? You know, plugging him into this band that's was kind of already established. But I mean, I liked it, but you're right. I don't think everything that he did fit. Well, but, and I, in doing research for this, I found out Coverdale, it's not like Coverdale liked what he did for, with Frank Zappa, where he's like, oh, you did great work with David Lee Roth. Like he saw him in the movie Crossroads 
with Ralph Macchio, <laughs> thought he was cool and looked great. So I was like, okay, yeah, bring him in. I'm like, are you kidding me? That's not how you decide who you're going to write music with. Come on. Yeah, and I think Vi was put in a weird spot, right? He's got to be in his own man. People mm-hmm. already know who he is. He's got to be as cool as he was in Roth because that's what he's getting credit for. He's got Vandenberg watching over his shoulder going, remember, we got to play this shit live. Like, don't get too crazy with it. Right. Right. And he's got Coverdale watching his every move going, well, John Sykes wouldn't have done that. You know, that kind of thing. I can only imagine he's in the room going, is that good or you want me to do it again? Like, I I don't, (laughs) I'm trying to be somebody here, but obviously I can't be me today. Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and look, they got some hits off it and some stuff that we like and that did well in the charts, but it, it, it didn't sell nearly as well. Now, I'm not one of those guys like, well, if you sell $8 million and the next one only sells $1 million, that's a total failure. It, it's not necessarily. It's like, you know, the music might still be good. It's just people have changed. Music tastes have changed. It's not the same anymore. But to me, it, 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 yeah, it's kind of a big departure. And, you know, going from $8 million to $1 million, you got to be a little disappointed in that. Yeah, and especially yeah, I think you, it's oh, go ahead. I was going to say especially when you when you you think you've got the secret sauce and now you've got this band put together, you have a little bit of a setback. Yeah, I mean it, it, a million records is nothing to sneeze at, but yes, coming off of 8 million you're like, "Oh, I thought we had this. I thought I thought it was just going to roll right into the next one." Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the reason you don't have the repeat is because it's tricky. Do you come back with a new album and open with a ballad because the women doubled your sales? Right. And every guy is going to stop coming now. <laughs> or do you open with a rocker to remind people you still rock and the women immediately lose interest in you? And they're like, okay, well, now there's plenty of other ballads to go to. And since you didn't open with one, I guess I'll go to Poison. Right. Right. Or whoever is out there at the time. I think it just stuck and it's hard to catch lightning in a bottle twice. It's just hard. It is. And even though they reworked Fool for Your Loving, which is uh, Fool for Your Loving, it's it's killer. I mean, I think they did a great job with it. Yeah. Fool for Your Loving, great White Snake song. Heavy, awesome. I don't know. It's just uh, the rest of it didn't have the same magic that the that the that 1987 did. So, hey, I'm glad they had that time and they captured it and they fit in and they benefited from it and you could argue they're all still benefiting from it now. I mean, as much as you might like Saints and Sinners, that's not the reason White Snake is still touring today. So it's it's this record right here. This is the one. Yeah, it's the record, and it's David Coverdale knows how to stay in uh, well, stay relevant. I guess mm-hmm. is the best way to put it. Because how many live albums have they released in the last 15 years? Right. Like, it seems like it's the same thing over and over and over, reliving the 80s. And Homie does not miss a 20-year, a 25-year, a 30-year, a 35-year. Like, he's he's got vaults in his vaults, it yes. seems like, right? So he's putting everything out there. And so I got a feeling he must have figured it out early that, I can live on this for the rest of my life. Yeah, and he even did those those. Uh, I don't even know what you would call them, like remix or redo. The, yeah. there was the Love album, the Rock album. Which, if you listen to the Rock album, Judgment Day from Slip of the Tongue is way better off that one. You just have Tommy Aldridge just beating the drums on that one. Yeah, did you pick those three up, Sonny? I think there was was it blues, rockers, and ballads. Is that right? Oh, I have it all. I have yeah. everything White Snake's ever put out there. That's why I know there's 83 live albums because I keep buying them going, <laughs> God, Dave, you don't even sound good on this. Why did you release this? <laughs> <laughs> like that one, uh, there's a 89.90 Slip of the Tongue live album. I forgot what the live album was called. I bought it because I'm like, oh, I want I want to hear Vi like live because you right? don't really have a way to do that, right? And I'm like, man, Vi sounds great. Coverdale doesn't sound that great singing it. And <laughs> right. I'm like, Ooh. Was it the one from Donington? Yeah, that's the one. Because because I've seen I've seen video from that, and he sounds Coverdale sounds horrible on that. I don't horrible. know if it was a bad yeah. day, what was going on, but he's yeah. Everybody else sounds the band sounds great. He sounds horrible. So would you still go see them now, buddy? I mean, would you still go if like if if White Snake's coming to town, maybe on their own, or maybe as part of a package of other, you know, rock bands? Would you go see him today? Hundred percent. You know, yeah. they had the, they have this reunion tour out there. I know they've canceled a couple of dates uh, uh, overseas, but mm-hmm. they're only playing, I think it's like 30 dates. So I'm going to have to probably travel to see them because they're not hitting everywhere. Right. And, you know, Coverdale's you know, he's 70 plus, right? So he's not going to hit the same notes and all that. But his band is still outstanding. And there's no reason to miss the band. And the music, I mean, it's, it's the music of my lifetime. Now, 
I won't ge- go see Crew because Vince has not kept himself in shape. Coverdale right. at least is in shape. He can still sell it. He can sing it. Eh, they'll be tuned down. He'll talk some of the stuff. He'll point the mic to the crowd every once in a while. Yeah. Sure. He's not going to be singing every fifth word. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So, and love Mick and Nikki and Tommy, but they ain't the guys that he's got in his band. So it's worth it just to go see the band. And the gals. He's got a woman on bass now who kills it. Who's got a lot of funk on her, right? She's yeah. really good. So, no, that's cool. I was just curious about that because, you know, because being in London, everybody comes to London. You know, if you're going to tour yeah. the UK or you're going to tour Europe, you know, I could go to shows every single night of the week if I had the time and the money, which I don't. Uh, so I kind of have to pick and choose. And I always wonder, like, well, I've never seen Whitesnake. And I know it's not the classic lineup, but I'm like, he's got Coverdale. He still does all those songs, you know. Maybe if they, you know, maybe is that worth seeing? So I got to talk to someone like you who knows their stuff inside and out to know if it would be worth doing. Yeah, Coverdale's a smart guy. He's going to do the songs everybody wants to hear. He'll add one or two in there because he knows there's, you know, diehards in the fan in the fan base that, you know, wants to hear a deep cut here and there. Mm-hmm. But you're not getting still the night howling at the moon, 1987, holding the Robert Plant note. But you ain't getting that from Plant either. Right. Right. So <laughs> it is what it is. He, he sings bluegrass songs with Alison Krauss now, dude. He, he's not the golden <laughs> yeah. god. Yeah, I mean, I love him and everything. But, I mean, he's, he's not doing it either. I, I just I want to know more about the, the tour. Because you saw him a few times in 1987. Height of their powers kind of thing. What was they like? Because you saw them both as an opening act and as a headliner. And, you know, you're a teenager back then. I mean, is that like, oh, my God, I want to do this every day the rest of my life? Like, overwhelming, like empowering kind of thing for you? Oh, 100%. 100%. You're you're watching these guys, and the crowd is 65% women. Mm-hmm. And they're wearing about as least amount of clothes as they can get away with. Right. And you're just in this crowd of people going, wow. Like, first of all, I am so glad that that's my hobby. Mm-hmm. When people tell me that they don't go to shows or they don't listen to music, I'm like, how in the hell do you live? Like, right. I don't even understand. Because I put myself in the Coliseum where the Warriors used to play basketball and you got the stage going on and the pit is on the bottom and the seats are on the sides and it's just power amongst power in that room. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Nothing brings people together. Nothing creates an energy like a good rock show does, man. I mean, there's nothing like it, you know. And and look, today, (laughs) these days, honestly, I rarely stay to the bitter end because I'm like, I... I got to beat the crowd out of here. I'm not sitting in traffic for an hour. I know what the set list is. If I've seen them do the last song, we're leaving during the second to last song. And that five minute head start saves me an hour, you know. But then even after I get home, I'm not like, okay, good. I'm home. I want to go to bed. I'm like, no, now I'm home. Whereas Jackson and I would then go to the bar and hang out till three in the morning back in the college days. <laughs> now I'm home, but I still got that concert buzz, right? My ears are ringing and I'm in a yeah. good mood. And I'm like, all right. Let me listen to the tracks they didn't play, or let me listen to the live album they did in 87. So I'm not going to bed. You know, I'm staying up till 2 in the morning anyway. I'm just doing it in a different way now because you can't beat good live music. Yeah, and I don't go to a lot of uh, stadium-type concerts anymore, though. I I like going to the clubs. I like going to theaters. There's a hard rock uh, in Cincinnati now, and they have probably a 5,000-seater upstairs. Oh, I didn't know that. And I just saw a show there. And uh, it's brand new. I guess it used to be called Jack's, but it's a hard rock now. Okay, yeah, sure. But I just saw a show there, and it, it's amazing. Because to me, when you get down to somewhere between 300 to 5,000 people, you've pretty much gotten rid of the folks that only know rock and roll night. Here I go again. And, you know, uh, I don't know, rock you like a hurricane, right? Like you got right. the folks that know the stuff. And it's more of a, I don't know, community, right? That has the same hobby you do. It's funny you say that because I went to go see the cult a couple months ago in Orlando at the House of Blues. A tiny place for them, but every single person was there, had the shirts on. They were all, there wasn't any casual fans. So you're right. I mean, everybody was there. Everybody knew every single song. It was great. And then I saw the the Motley Crue Def Leppard Stadium Tour. And I thought to myself, this is probably, I mean, it was cool to see. 
and and I took my son and that was the first one, the first big show that he'd ever seen. But I'm like, yeah, this is probably the last one for me because you're right. Being in a club, it's more intimate. They're, I mean, you're a thousand miles away at the stadium tour. The sound was actually not bad, but yet yeah, the, the whole atmosphere is is better at a smaller venue. Yeah, you're going to have to go to Bogarts, uh, man. I don't know if you've already been to some shows there, yeah. but. But, you know, I, I saw the Colt a couple times at Bogart's. Great, great place to go. I, they used to, I think it was called the Taft Theater. I think they may have changed the name or, you know, it's probably now called the, the PNC something or something like that. But um, there's a couple. And then obviously the Riverbend Amphitheater is great. So you're, you're in a good spot there. Not everybody comes to Cincinnati the way everyone comes to like L.A. or San Francisco. Living in Louisville, you know, it's kind of the same way. But sometimes I go to Cincinnati. Sometimes I go to Columbus. Sometimes I go to Indianapolis. Sometimes I go to Nashville. All those places are one and a half to three hours away from where I was, you know. And so you you might have to do a little bit of that, that in Cincinnati. But I'll tell you, in Ohio, they come. I mean, Cleveland and Columbus and in, in Cincinnati, they don't, nobody skips all of those, right? It, but you may not hit all three, but nobody skips all of those. So you're still going to have great opportunities to see band. And Indy's not that far away. Lexington, Kentucky, which doesn't get that many, but that's not that far away. Louisville's not that far away. So are you going to do, are you going to do Louder Than Life down there in September in Louisville? I'm not much of a festival guy. Yeah, me neither. I, I do the Monsters of Rock cruises instead. I want to be on a cruise mm-hmm. if it's going to be a festival. I got you. Um, but like there's the Blue Room here. I think it's called the Blue Room. It's in Hamilton, I think, or something like that. I went to go see a show there. JD Legends has Lita Ford and Firehouse next mm-hmm. Friday. I'm going to go see like these places. You're talking about 500 people. Yeah. So much better, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, so much better. But the festival, come on. Like even the Monsters of Rock Cruise, I've only been, I got to like at least half the bands. Otherwise I don't go to those, right? Because I want to see a bunch of bands. Absolutely. You know, it's hard for me to give six straight hours. I mean, you know, pl- plus I got to get down there. Plus I got to get back. Plus in Louisville, Kentucky in September, it's a hundred degrees. And it's like, you know, <laughs> even if the three bands I love, if there's four bands I can't stand, it's like, am I really going to go? I don't think so. You know? So I, I did go to BST Hyde Park here a few different nights, but that's really just one band. Like I get in, I see the Rolling Stones, I get out. I go see Duran Duran, I leave before Rio comes on, you know, kind of thing. Because I don't want to be leaving with 85,000 drunken idiots, right? But you're right, club shows. And it's just, I don't know, I'm just so happy to have music back. Because over here, especially, Sonny, the lockdowns were a lot tighter. And they they canceled everything over here, basically, for a year and a half, two years. So now that it's back, you know, in a month, I'm going to see like five or six shows. Because, you know, i got to squeeze it all in. But... I know that you like Jackson, like me, like so many of us who love rock music. We're just happy that the live music is back, man. Yeah, that's what's so great about the cruises. So you could see Skid Row at 8 o'clock at night. At 9, 10, Faster Pussycats playing, you can go and go gamble for a while. <laughs> at 10 o'clock, Richie Kotzen's playing, you can go to Richie Kotzen. And at 11 o'clock, you can go drinking with everybody at the karaoke bar and catch a Atomic Punks at 12.30 in the morning, Van Halen cover. You know, so you can go to the room anytime you want. Go eat anytime you want. Go gamble anytime you want. Go see a show anytime you want for five straight days, right? So there is no going home. There's no getting in a car. There's none of that. And there's 50 bands, right? So, I mean, where else can you go to that that six days? Nobody's going to pay that kind of money unless they're true fans. Mm -hmm. So you're basically on sea with 3,000 people to have the same hobby you do. It's impossible. You would say, if you were into the bands, if the band roster was something that you like, it was definitely worth going on the cruise. Yeah, yeah. I'm, okay. I'm 50-50. If yeah. it's half the bands that I like and would go see, then I'm in. Okay. And there no, was okay. a couple of cruises where like Vince Neil was the headliner. I'm like, no, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> But there must be, even if you're 50-50, there must be some stuff that you see on the cruise where you say, hey, I would have said no. But now that I hear them play, okay, no, you got a fan now. And the other way, right? So I'll give you an example. I saw Honey's Moon Suite, saw yeah. Honeymoon Suite live. I'm like, oh my God, I had no idea they were that good. I Ooh. thought saw Thunder live. I'm like, my God, dude, why don't these guys play the US? These guys are awesome, right? But then I remember seeing Lita live. And I'm going to go see Lita again because I'm just a Lita fan. But I'm sitting there going, these songs are not that great. Like, what yeah. the hell? And I'm like, <laughs> oh, I was listening with my eyes. That's right. what Now I remember. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I watched the video, but I didn't listen on the radio. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's the reason. We, look, we asked you for an hour. You gave us two. We, we really appreciate it, Sonny. Can you tell everybody about where they find you on uh, Growing Up Rock and Album Review Crew and all that? Yeah, the easiest thing is hit me on Twitter um, or growinguprock.com. I'm with the Shout It Loud Loud cast guys doing uh, Album Review Crew, which is fun. And uh, live on Facebook, Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, we do Podcast Rock City. So, you know, I, I'm not on Instagram, but I am on Facebook and Twitter and people find me somehow. It's not an issue. Uh, well, we're glad we found you, man. You've got the great radio voice. You've got uh, 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 taste in music that overlaps quite a bit with us. But I think we need to get you on to, to talk about something that you like that we really don't sometimes. That'll really get the listeners into it. Because I'll tell you, folks, he showed me his bang zone of like top 20 bands and Richard Marks was on there. And I got to tell you, that does not jibe. Uh, with the ugly American werewolf in London's <laughs> bang so yeah, exactly. You know, so so Hall and Oates did, but Richard Marks doesn't. Hall and Oates, eh, I could do a Hall and Oates show. I could do a Hall and Oates show. The Richard Marks show, I could do a Richard Marks show with Richard Marks, and it would be horrible because I'm like, Richard, you seem like a nice guy. Why is your music so shitty, buddy? You know, <laughs> you're a nice looking guy. You sold a lot of records. You seem awesome, like a good dude on Twitter. Yeah, why does your music suck ass? I'm like, why do housewives like your shit, but grown men hate it? Why is that? That would be a very short show. <laughs> <laughs> it's good stuff. No, thanks for having me. It's a ton of fun, and I'd do it anytime. That's no issue. All right, well, we'll let you get on with your Sunday there, Mr. Sonny Pooney. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us on The Ugly American Werewolf in London. Thanks, Sonny. Thank you. Well, that wraps up a very long 88th edition of the Ugly American Werewolf in London Rock podcast. Can't thank Sonny Pooney enough for coming on the show and imparting all his knowledge and experience to us. Great guy who's a huge rock and roll fan, and that kind of mid to late 80s hard rock, I think that's just what he loves. It's his thing. He's an expert in his field, and he's had a lot of experience, been to a lot of shows, has a lot of records, grew up during that time, and uh, obviously he has a couple of great, great podcasts like Growing Up Rock and the Album Review Crew. Go find Sonny Pooney however you do it, uh, whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, growinguprock.com. We really appreciate you being on, Sonny. We can talk to you about a lot of different things, uh, and I'm hopeful that over the months and years to come, we will be doing just that with you. So, as usual, folks, did we get something right? Did we get something wrong? Did we miss the point? Did we leave out your favorite part? Hey, you got to let us know. You can tweet us at ugly underscore werewolf or at actionjack72. You can also email us, uglyamericanwerewolf at gmail.com. Let us know which bands, records, concerts, DVDs, books, which rock properties you want us to review. And thank you, as always, to our Pantheon podcast family. You can check it out at Pantheon Pods or www.pantheonpodcast.com. And, of course, thank you to our sponsor, rarevinyl.com or eil.com, where if you use the code PODCAST, you can get 10% off your favorite rare, hard-to-find, and pristine records, whether it's vinyl, CD, singles, whatever you might be looking for. On that note, I hope to have somebody from Rare Vinyl on our show here before too long to kind of let you know what's going on there and what they do at Rare Vinyl, how they take good care to find the best quality and classic records out there that people are going to want. But I don't know what's coming next week. There's a lot up in the air right now, a lot going on in the Wolf's Den here. So you're just going to have to tune in to find out. But please do tune in and wherever you get your podcast, be it Good Pods, be it Apple or iTunes, Amazon, Google Play. It doesn't really matter. If you like the show, please do us a favor. Give us a positive review. It just helps us find more rock and roll fans like you. And if you send it to us or we get wind of it, we might just read it here on the show. All right, this show is long enough, folks. So to all of you rock and rollers all around the world, be cool and stay safe.